In 1962, 21-year-old American soldier James Dresnok was facing a court-martial. He was stationed at the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. The young soldier was caught forging his superior's autograph to leave his army base to visit his favorite local woman of the night. Real classy. A few hours before he was scheduled to meet with his commander, Dresnok took a radical decision that would forever change his life. As his fellow soldiers were having lunch, he bolted through the demilitarized zone and surrendered to the dumbfounded North Korean border guards. James Dresnok had officially defected to North Korea, the giant prison state where he lived for over 50 years. James Joseph Dresnok was born in Norfolk, Virginia on November 24, 1941. His parents, Lucille and Joseph, had a troubled marriage resulting in young James' tough childhood. They had another younger son, Joseph II. His father was a veteran of the United States Army and his mother was a housewife and appeared to be an alcoholic. James later described his parents as fighting like cats and dogs. In 1951, the unhappy couple filed for divorce, leading to James briefly staying with his father in Pennsylvania while his younger brother was sent to his grandfather. James was dropped off at his aunt's house while his father worked. He wasn't welcome and ran away multiple times. It didn't take long for his father to drop him off in a foster home, abandoning him. He flunked out of high school that same year. Frankly, early on, James' life hadn't been taking a pleasant direction. Still, a radio interview with his foster father described him as a normal boy, mischievous, but always with a tear of repentance in his eyes. Not having much going on for him, and perhaps as a last resort to create some sort of stability, on November 25, 1958, one day after his 17th birthday, James enlisted in the U.S. Army. Many disadvantaged youths saw the Army as a way out, and it often provided salvation to these youths shaping structure, providing income, and the possibilities to educate oneself further. Initially, this appeared to be the case for James as well. While on leave, he proposed to 19-year-old Kathleen Ringwood, their married not too long after. In an interview much later, he attributed his marriage to an attempt to forget his childhood's pain. Still, this marriage, too, wasn't successful. Soon after they tied the knot, James was deployed to West Germany for two years. When he returned in 1961, Kathleen had been unfaithful and was actively engaged in another relationship. Still, the couple didn't divorce immediately, but it's safe to assume there was no romance anymore. In later years, James recounted how the only upside of it all was that Kathleen never got pregnant because he swore he would never abandon his children. Then again, there wasn't much time for romance. James immediately re-enlisted as a private first class to be deployed to the Korean demilitarized zone. He arrived there in May 1962, stating at that point he didn't care whether he lived or died. During this time, the Korean War was still freshly imprinted in the minds of many. The DMZ was the most tangible symbol of the Cold War divide, perhaps before the Berlin Wall was built. On the southern side, most of the services and goods were aimed at the US servicemen and their paychecks. James spent all his income on the local ladies of the night. In August that year, not even half a year later, James had been serving on a stakeout post for two weeks. While his fellow soldiers were allowed to go in the village, his company commander ordered him to remain at his post. And that's when James forced his sergeant's signature on the slip and went on pass regardless. Obviously recognized by his fellow servicemen, the following day his commander summoned him and told him he'd expect James in his office by 3 p.m., fully intending to court-martial him. At noon that day, while everyone was eating lunch, James took the gamble. He walked into the minefield and then bolted through it. He reached the outpost of the North Korean army when the border guards on duty surrounded him. James was blindfolded, tied up and arrested. He had officially defected to North Korea. Dresnok enjoyed an unusual life in North Korea, although admittedly any life of a US serviceman in the Hermit Kingdom can be classified as unusual. Over the decades, to the outside world, he became known as perhaps the most fervent Western supporter of the Kim regime. But initially, it wasn't necessarily like that. James was interrogated at length, but he didn't have much valuable information considering he wasn't even stationed at the DMZ for six months. After that, he was put together with James Epshire, the first U.S. soldier to defect to North Korea after the Korean War. 
One year later, Corporal Jerry Wayne Parrish joined them when he defected during a regular patrol round. And in 1965, Charles Robert Jenkins abandoned his patrol and he defected to North Korea out of fear that he'd be deployed to Vietnam. I've covered his life in a separate video if you're interested in that story after this one. These four men now became minor celebrities in North Korea, appearing on propaganda posters, pamphlets, photos, and eventually films. James turned on the entire United States Army and recorded propaganda speeches, which the North Koreans would then play through megaphones along the DMZ towards South Korea. And the propaganda photos and posters made it look like the men ended up in Utopia. Obviously, this was far from the truth. And as time progressed, the men began doubting if they made the right choice. Because, well, life in North Korea wasn't anything the propaganda they produced made it out to be. There were widespread famines. The men were put under 24-7 guards. And at least one of them, Jenkins, recounted how their guards regularly beat them. Not to mention the fact that they were in a communist state with customs and people alien to them. Being 195 meters tall, James stood out of crowds and was shunned on the street, in stores and basically everywhere. Four years after his defection in 1966, together with the three other US defectors, they took radical action. They sought help at the Soviet Union's embassy in Pyongyang. They hoped the Soviet Union would grant them asylum. Probably unbeknownst to them, the Cuban Missile Crisis had recently ended, and the Soviets weren't too eager to take a group of US defectors. As the Soviets refused them, their diplomats alerted the North Korean authorities who detained the four men. Attempting to flee North Korea meant facing severe punishment, obviously, perhaps even execution. But Pyongyang must have considered the defectors too valuable to simply get rid of them. Instead, as punishment, the men suffered a harsh routine of re-education. In a one-room apartment in Pyongyang, the four men were re-educated and forced to study Kim Il-sung's works for 10 hours per day. According to Dresnok, this was the moment he decided not to attempt to leave North Korea and simply adjust. Although admittedly there weren't that many options and alternatives to begin with. The regime didn't use the men for propaganda anymore and for years they would not be heard from again. James made a serious effort to learn Korean and soon became more or less fluent. Kim Il-sung's writings, the ones he was forced to read 10 hours per day, impressed him to the degree that he began translating them to English. He studied North Korea's history, its culture, the laws and policies of the Workers' Party. They stayed in the tiny apartment for years, reading hours per day, receiving beatings from guards and realizing they needed to make themselves valuable to the regime if they wanted to survive. During this time, the deserters had a serious falling out, with the fight mainly centered around Dresnok and Jenkins. At any rate, by 1972, the North Koreans decided the defector's re-education was sufficient. James became an official North Korean citizen, received food rations, his own modest apartment in Pyongyang and a job. Throughout the rest of his life, he worked as an English teacher in Pyongyang, educating both the North Korean youth and troops at military bases. Besides jobs such as teaching English at military bases, most defectors received North Korean propaganda film roles. James enjoyed his first big break in 1978 playing the villain in a war epic. It elevated him to celebrity status in North Korea. He played the archetypical American villain that the heroic North Koreans would eventually beat. That was the premise. James starred in several more films like this. He played the same character in each of them. The ruthless American POW camp commander Arthur. And funnily enough, Arthur became an endearing nickname for him from the North Koreans. James also was forced into a marriage with an abducted woman. The other three American deserters, too, were forced into marriages with abductees. North Korea's idea behind these forced marriages was to receive offspring with Western characteristics that could be utilized as spies. Romanian Doina Bumbea, abducted from Italy by North Korean agents, married him. The couple had two sons, Ted and James. In 1997, Doina passed away and James remarried to a woman whose name is unknown, but for sure she is the daughter of a Korean woman and a Togolese diplomat. Their son, Tony, was born in 2001. James' most recent information and footage came from the 2006 documentary, Crossing the Line, which centered around him. In it, he reiterated his conviction that North Korea is the place to be for him. 
Even if there are a billion dollars in gold on the table, he will not leave. He considers North Korea his home. If you haven't seen the documentary yet, it is definitely worth watching. As for the allegations about bad living conditions in North Korea, James denied everything, obviously. I mean, he still lived there. But when Jenkins returned to Japan with his wife, he revealed many abuse cases of the prison state, the malnourishment, beatings, and the program to train Western-looking children to spy. James denied all these allegations against the North Korean regime and does not appear to have had any faltering loyalty to the communist prison state. But already during the shooting of the documentary, Bonner and the director, Daniel Gordon, reported that James was in bad health due to his alcohol and smoking habits. For example, a scene showed James being reprimanded by a North Korean doctor for drinking and smoking too much. Gordon even openly speculated James would not be able to see the final result, although that prediction turned out to be a bit too pessimistic. It wasn't until 2016 when North Korean state media published a short clip featuring James' two sons that it became clear James passed away earlier that year. Interestingly enough, both his sons speak Korean fluently and they wear the typical North Korean military uniform. They speak English with a severe accent. Dresnok's three sons and wife survived him. All of them remain in North Korea, and the oldest two sons played roles in North Korean propaganda films, just like his father, and they served in the military. Thank you for watching this video. If there's a topic or event you'd like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. You can buy merchandise such as this mug on my website. The link is in the description, together with a discount code. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider checking me out on Patreon or becoming a channel member. For just $1 a month, you will already gain access to the exclusive Patreon series. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.